This week's episode is brought to you by Stuff. So with Father's Day right around the corner, what am I getting Big Jim this year other than a kiss on the lips? Some Stuff. Stuff is a personal care brand that helps fund young men's mental health through their charity partner, The Man Cave. For every $1,000 in sales, Stuff will sponsor one boy to experience The Man Cave's life-changing programs. It's genuinely a win-win. When you buy your dad Stuff, you're doing good and helping him smell even better. Thank them later. They've got stuff for your body, your head, your face, your pits, and all the important bits. It's Australian-made, cruelty-free, planet-friendly, and also contains no bad stuff like parabens and aluminium. So shop Father's Day gifts at websiteofstuff.com and get your order in by the 31st to make sure Dad gets his gift in time. So use the code STUFFTILL for 20% off at the websiteofstuff.com. The link will also be in the show notes. Let's go. Hunter Johnson, welcome to the Dylan Friends Podcast, my friend. It's a real treat, real privilege to have you on the show. Mate, I've been looking forward to this moment for a long time and I'm just excited. <laughs> so am I. Um, yeah, as I said, mate, we touched base a while ago, I think, just through... I don't actually even know how to do it. There's through mutual friends. I remember having a Zoom with you um, when I was in Byron Bay a long time ago when we were allowed to sort of move around the country, which was, which was fun and... Um, we had a chat a bit about your organisation that you're doing and your business, and just just connected. It was really it was really cool. Just two guys chatting and like becoming friends as older men is weird, but it was like cool. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's been true. You're like it's kind of like a mandate, and you're like yeah, it was a wow, mandate. I'm really like this guy. Wow. Okay. <laughs> like, what's the next step here? Do I do I ask him for a beer or a coffee? But he's in Byron, and that looks way better than being locked down where I am. So I don't know what to do. <laughs> oh, uh, so we do a so podcast. True. That's just what you do in 2021. You do a podcast. You do, yeah. No. Pod, the, why have a conversation privately when you can record it and let other people listen to it? Is is what I say. It's uh, it's definitely overrated. That is the, effectively how you've built the second part of your career. I think. Yeah. <laughs> hey, mate. Let's talk about um you today and all the incredible things you're doing um it, yeah it, it really is inspirational it's something that to be honest i admire i love um creating you know healthy masculinity in, in young men and something i'm extremely passionate about but i must admit it's still something that i really don't know a lot about i feel like i i, I am a healthy man i feel like i am but i i also question some things and even having this chat today um you know made me reflect a lot on what it was like growing up for me and how I've probably grown up over the years and how we all grow up over the years and how our surroundings um, shape who we are. And, and yeah, to give context of, of what you do at the Man Cave and what you do with, with stuff and everything else you do in your life, that is the main focus, creating these, these safe places for, for young males. That's it, mate. And I think I've had probably a very similar journey to you, mate. Um, I think the models of masculinity that we inherited from our dads and our grandfathers are very different to the models of masculinity that, you know, the next generation of young men are inheriting. And I think it's, it's confusing. You know, we're in a time where it's post the Me Too era. There's a whole movement around gender equality. Um, there's, you know, Black Lives Matter. There's like discussions of privilege and power and entitlement. Um, as well as toxic masculinity. Um, and these are just, you know, words and phrases that we didn't grow up with. Um, and, you know, I, if I reflect back on my high school, it was just about social survival. You know, it was just working out who did I need to be amongst the boys to be able to get through, you know, whether that was have be the best at sport, have the best banter, you know, or just find whatever my niche was so that I could fit and feel safe with my mates. Then that was the way that I'd, got through it and, and I think that's you know we, we work with thousands of teenage boys now and it, you just watch the same story playing out so I think you know I'm, I'm excited to talk about that with you Dil just both our experiences growing up and then you know also what we're seeing now to, to be a good man in 2021. Mate, there's so many questions that I've, I've got from that one little intro but I, I suppose I'll start with with a big with a big hitter for, for, for males in general and I think for me you know it, I'll, I'll be honest, for, for a long time, toxic masculinity, I was like, what, what is this? You know, I don't know what this is. I don't, I don't get it. I, I have no idea what's going on here. But I think as I've gotten older and matured, I've, I've realised it's it's not personally yourself. It's it's probably a culture that we've grown up in. And it's hard to identify that when you're in it and you are a man and you don't know what it's like to not be a boy or a male. Um, but to this day, I still find it really hard to articulate what that is. What is toxic masculinity and what is a healthy masculinity 
Yeah, it's so layered, isn't it? Like even the words toxic masculinity just feel a bit edgy. Um, so the, the way that I think about it is um, we're not, first of all, we're not saying masculinity is toxic, but what mm. we're saying is there are certain components of the masculine experience that are destructive. And they are things like very homophobic behavior, uh, real strong beliefs in like real gender norms, um, very much a big believer in like privilege and entitlement or um, power, power dynamics, um, or just um, it, it becomes about dominance and control. And, um, you know, I'm sure from both our lived experiences, we've both been, you know, um, impacted by that, but probably also been the perpetrator of that too, uh, in ways that are really unconscious to us. And so, you know, we, if, you know, if we think about where, you know, we're a couple guys, you know, however old we are, I'm, I'm 30, um, it's hard enough for us to navigate it as blokes at this age as adults. Imagine being a teenage boy trying to navigate your brain developing, your body developing, you want to fit in at school, you've got social media. Um, suddenly now you're being labeled as, you know, all, all men are toxic in, in some ways, um, whether you understand that or not. And it's just incredibly confusing for these young men. So what we really try to do at, at Man Cave is just really simplify it and just go, hey, we're not saying all men are toxic, but what we're saying is there are certain things um, that we may have done in our life or may be impacted by that aren't helping us be the best men we can possibly be. And that doesn't mean we have to throw out all the fun, cool things about being a bloke out the window, but we're just providing an opportunity for us to expand more of our humanity. And just to do that in a way that's like, not showing how woke we are, we're not virtue signaling, but just making it really accessible to young men. And you know, I think the flip side of that is healthy masculinity for me is just um, the, the characteristics of a, a healthy, flourishing human being, someone who can, you know, is kind, they're honest, they're res resilient, um, they can deal with adversity, um, they're generous, you know, they're determined and disciplined. It's, it's you know, effectively the one and the same of being, a, a, as I said, a flourishing human being. Love it. I think you've, you've absolutely nailed it there. It's, it's not the fact of, of condemning men and being like, hey, all men are, are bad, but it's identifying, hey, there is some really fucked up shit that, that men do. Let's not do that and let's be the best version of ourselves that we can. Yeah, and it's interesting, right? Because we live in a world now where cancel culture is a full thing, you know? And what we're seeing is, you know, people who did a tweet, you know, 10 to 15 years ago are now being canceled because of a joke that they made that was relevant to the psychology and the consciousness of that time. And now they're paying for the impact of that, although they have, may have grown and developed. Um, and it's interesting, right? Because we're the generation where everything's been documented. You know, it's like the Facebook memes that come up and you're like, oh, oh yeah. my God, let me remove tag or remove post because it was just something you'll throw on over to your mate. Um, and the thing that I'm really starting to think through is like, you know, from a psychology point of view, what are the incentives for men to take accountability and responsibility for their previous behavior? when the impact is or what potentially and we hear this from boys is there's no incentive for them um, because of cancel culture they're just so petrified that they might step out of line that they may say something that's inappropriate that they might not articulate something that is very nuanced and specific that then they'll they'll just be seen as a bad bloke and won't be able to come back which is just a crazy phenomenon to be in and i say that not um, ignoring the responsibility that, uh, that these boys need to take to create a better world for all of us. But I just think it's a really interesting thing that's not talked about. What is the antidote to cancel culture? And, and, and I just think that's where at an interesting time in, in society to, to reflect on questions like that. It's, I don't have the answer for it, to be honest. I, I really don't. I, it's such a, a scary thing. We're just, I think we're just such an inflection point for so many things in society. And I just don't know if that's COVID has exacerbated that. It's brought things forward. But, you know, I think if we bring it back to masculinity, we're at such a point of evolution, I think, you know, and, and I think, you know, coming back to what we joked about earlier is like, you know, banter is a way that guys connect and it, it's a way that we know it's almost like a disarming thing. It's like, can I trust you? Can I not? Um, and it's a way that we can kind of, 
play it safe with someone until we get to know them we can really trust and feel safe with them but mm. also there's that whole other side to banter right where it just becomes about one-upmanship and just you know paying out your mate and then that becomes like the social currency of your, your friendship group at times um so i'm just i'm, I'm curious for you actually deal like growing up in a you know where footy was your kind of world and you know much your identity um growing up and you know i love what you've done with with dan with list cloggers and and just everything like that how did you navigate um yourself mate being someone with someone with such like kind qualities as what you have and then into like a real high performing very alpha environment how did you dance through that oh mate we could and as i said before the reflection that i've had in in the last little week leading up to this just thinking about it um there's some there's some things that i'm honestly not proud of as a a young bloke that i would have been like and and the way i would have treated people and and i think that i was definitely a stereo typical um uh, younger male you know played footy and i thought with that that uh the the alpha tag would would have to come with that and whether that was being um dominant in my group and and taking banter too far and pushing the boundaries um yeah there's things there that like again is it is it a part of growing up but i also think that it's it's just something that like what you do now I, i didn't really have role models or or healthy masculinity in my life to actually know that that wasn't the right way to do things um and i think it, it took for me to to really face some adversity when i got to football clubs and and be faced with it the other way from other people to go like fuck that actually makes me feel like shit like yeah. i really don't like these situations i don't like being put in these situations um i don't like doing things i don't want to do you know as a young 18 year old kid um coming from school joining an afl club and realizing that what was the biggest problem for me was being liked versus being respected. And I've, mm. I've spoken about that a lot. And I think it's the biggest problem that young men yeah. want. You said before, you know, you, you hid at school um, by just doing what you could to fit in and get by. And I think that's exactly what I did as well. Like I thought, well, this is what I have to do. I have to play footy, talk to, talk to the cool kids and, and try and um, talk to girls to be cool. And then people will just leave me alone. And that's probably what I did when I got to a footy club. I was like, all right, well, uh, guys that play AFL, um, they gamble. That's cool. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start gambling. Um, they go clubbing. All right, sweet. Like, that's cool. I'll start going clubbing. And it took me, like, probably two or three years to honestly work out. Like, fuck, man, I really don't like any of these things. Yeah. And I'm putting myself through hell to, like, try and fit in when, realistically, people don't, the, when it comes to it, and the biggest lesson I learned was people don't want people they like at the end of the day. They want people that they respect. Mm. Um, and when I looked at that and in situations in my life when I was like, well, do I like this guy that tells me everything I want to hear or do I like the person and respect the person that says, he tells me things that I don't want to hear but tells them to me because I need to hear them? Um, so that was probably a big revelation for me, just like, oh, well, fuck. For so long, I've been doing things that I don't want to do and embarrassed to, to show who I am. But um, yeah, I think it just comes from lowing and growing and learning and being putting yourself in different situations. Yeah, and I think it's also, it comes like if, as I, what I hear in that, it, it comes down to belonging and, and culture. And it's like, there's an innate human desire for us to want to be in a group, right? Because if we're not, if we, you know, go back X many thousands of years and we're not in a group, we're by ourselves and then we're at massive risk of dying. And so it's actually, there's like a biological reason why we will sometimes sacrifice our own values in order to be with the group. Um, And then the question is, what is the culture of the group that we're stepping into? And, you know, I listening to you, I'm like, that's almost word for word exactly my high school experience was I was on a, a daily report card at school where after every class I had to walk up and give my like little piece of paper and they had to like mark me a certain grade or I'd be kicked out of school. Um, and I it was just, it was kind of this balance of like, it was fun to be cheeky and naughty and a thrill seeker and it was fun to live for the weekend and it was fun to have the stories that I could then use at lunchtime at school but what was really missing for me was any 
like a role model who was this non-authoritative figure that could actually sit me down and not shame me or guilt me or say, don't do that, but actually just go, hey, mate, you're acting like a bit of a dick. And I know that's not who you are, but I just want to give you a chance to kind of flex that you know, that leadership potential in a completely different way. Would you be open to doing that? Because I think your life would be better opposed to just like you just trying to run on the hamster wheel of trying to remain in the cool group. And I'm like, you know, how we just need to find more ways to give access to young men like that because just a crazy phenomenon that's happened for me just since starting the man cave is, um, well, first of all, being really honest about myself and, you know, when I used to hang out with my mates, the guys I used to bully, which I just thought was banter, but now with a bit of hindsight, it was totally bullying. Mm. It's really interesting to hear, um, to see, sorry, the amount of guys that um, impact, uh, sorry, message me either on like Instagram or LinkedIn and go, holy shit. I wish Man Cave existed when I was younger. Oh, for is sure, there man. is there a way that I can come and help out? Like it would have just made such a difference for my life. And you know, if we put to like the impact of not having something like Man Cave, it, the impact is effectively the mental health statistics that we're familiar with. You know, that one in four young men is likely to experience a mental illness before they're eighteen. Suicide is the leading cause of death for young men under the age of 25. So it's not um, overdosing on drugs. It's not coward punches. It's actually themselves. But then the other side of that, and I'm sure we'll get to this later, is that one in three women is likely to experience um, sexual abuse from a man in their life, which is just wild to think about. And the other side of that is women could sit down and tell you all the stories about um, men they know who have sexually abused them. Um, but I, you know, how many men could we sit down with and say, we know who the perpetrators are. Mm. And it's, it's such a tricky balance talking about this stuff. Even you and I, right. From our histories, like who are we to talk about this? You know, there may be things in my past that I look back on now with a bit more hindsight that I go, fuck, that was really out of alignment. So it's, it's such an edgy topic going, can we talk about this or not? Because we're not perfect, but we do want to create a better world. And, you know, I'm just at that cliff. I don't have the answers of that yet. I'm just start right now leading into it with you. Oh, mate, that's why it's so brave. And, and to be honest, if we weren't doing a podcast, I'd just sit back and go, fuck, I don't have the answer for that right now because I, I really don't. And, and you're so right where, where, where we, when you talk about um, sexual harassment from, from males, it's been one of those... Another topic that it's so um, it's so scary to talk about because, as you said earlier, you don't want to say the wrong thing, and 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 not that there is a wrong thing to say because it is prevalent that it does happen. But the biggest thing before that you said is how do you know when you don't necessarily, um, you know, I, I go, I'm not going and out and doing this. So how how do I know how to who is and and all these sorts of things? But I, I remember a quote that sort of came by. I was actually watching a movie and, and the the um, the name of the movie was actually about this sort of thing. I'll, I'll get the name of the movie and have it in the show notes. You might even remember when I'm, I'm bringing it out. But there was a, a female that was talking about at the start of the movie and it said, um, every male's worst nightmare is to be accused of sexual harassment. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, like that would fucking suck. Like imagine that. And then it goes, well, every woman's nightmare is to be sexually harassed. Mm. And I was just like fuck like you dickhead like for so long you know you you worry about yourself and you think like oh this would be bad but fucking think put your shoes in the other foot it's a fucking 10 times worse situation to be in and i think that the less we can probably think about ourselves in that situation the easier it is to understand and then to act yeah, mate. And I, and I think it's like, how do we not wait for those moments of watching a movie or, you know, you hear men who, you know, have been pretty alpha blokes have a daughter and then they're like, oh, shit, I don't want my daughter to date guys like my mates. So mm. I want to, I, I care about gender equality now. So it's like, yeah. cool, that's so fine. But how do we get it? even younger where we have teenage boys wanting to create a more equal world for their friends who identify as women or everything in between, you know, and, and it's such a, you know, we're such, we're at a real reckoning for masculinity right now. Like some of the most important women in my life, women who have raised me, shaped me into the man I am, as I've started to kind of become more aware and just talk about this stuff and fumble through it, I've started to hear their stories of their own experiences of sexual abuse and harassment. And these are women who have raised me. And it's just like, 
you know, what, what more is it going to take for us to start to do something about that? And it's just, I think it starts with conversations like this that are just a bit messy where we don't have the answers, but we lean in and we just give it a crack and, you know, hopefully it just nudges the conversation and the movement forward just a little bit more. Oh, oh mate, I, uh, yeah, look, I, I'm not lying. I've got like a lot of goosebumps in this, just thinking about family, you know, my sister and, and my partner, my mum. Yeah, these people that have, have probably gone through a lot of things that I've, you know, not, not been aware of. Um, and, and I, yeah, it, it honestly... It's hard to, to even think about, um, but I think that again, this this episode today, I really hope that people can just understand that w- we are bumbling through this because there is we're, we're not saying we have an answer to it. It's just I think we're both just trying to understand it and educate each other more, and, and everyone else listening into what is it, and maybe just question some things in anyone else's mind where they could have done better or they they could have called something out earlier. Because um, yeah, like to be honest, I'm. Yeah, I really don't even have the answers to to these sort of problems we face. And and I think that's where it starts still. It's like we don't – it'd be crazy if we had the answers. Like it's we're just – we're nudging up against this and maybe the answer for right now is actually us just leading into the awkward, uncomfortable, you know, even politically incorrect conversation. Um, And I think for me it it comes back to self-awareness and if I think about, you know, what is man cave, which I probably should just say what that is. Um, Yeah, that was actually the first question on my list that I just um, skipped past. What is man cave? Cool, let's just go there for a bit. (laughs) Sorry for the huge tangent. Um, So just by the way, man cave is actually why we've got you on the show i've just forgotten to uh to bring that up just so, give us a bit of a rundown of what man cave so is please fine, dude. um so man cave we're, we're a charity that effectively runs programs for teenage boys aged 12 to 16 where we just create safe spaces for them to just take off the mask they wear and start to open up and um, have authentic honest conversations with themselves with their mates uh, often for the very first time and um what we find is a lot of these boys are kind of just on autopilot just like you know living in the culture that they're in just throwing banter around not taking life too seriously but what they'll often find in our programs is you know they'll say this bloke's been my best mate for five years and i've just learned more about him in five minutes than five years of our friendship Mm. or you know we have sisters emailing in going i don't know what the fuck you did with our with my brother but um can i come do work experience for you because he's just a changed changed guy in the house and you know we've now worked with about twenty thousand boys and um the you know, we've got about 300 schools on the waiting list. Um, and our whole approach is just taking a strengths-based approach to working with young men. So seeing all their gifts, their unique spirit, and just giving them the tools to navigate not only like a very turbulent teenage years, but just life, like the, the uncertainty that comes with life. And, and for me, kind of pulling it back to where we just left off, it just begins with self-awareness because with self-awareness, we have the ability to have a self-inquiry, to make choices and hopefully to make a, a make a positive impact and you know the way that we do that is through super diverse very relatable facilitators kind of like guys like you and i but from really diverse backgrounds as well who go into high schools and just act as that cooler relatable role model who just um isn't there to get the boys in trouble um but actually just create that space for them to to be a role model really i think something that you do really well with with the man cave and, and your personality and just your general aura of a, of a person too is is the moment um and, and we both know this and i think everyone knows this the moment you say hey we're going to come talk to you about your mental health and being a man people go oh they just tune out you know boys are just like oh fuck this i don't know what yeah. the hell is going on here like oh that's that's not for me and i was the same but i think the best part about being a male is trying to have those conversations you lead in with other things and make it a fun environment talk about other things and it's not just like a face-to-face conversation about De- uh, bearing your dark, deep and darker secrets, but you ease in with other conversations, and then it ends up getting there anyway. Totally, mate. And and I think there's there's something about authenticity that just changes the room, you know. And it 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 gives permission for others to do the same, and it actually brings a group closer, right? Which is the whole origin of the the tigers, you know, Triple H's, right? Is it it's mm. a it's a consistent platform for people in the group to step into sharing some of their highs, their lows and their biggest lessons. And what that is is them sharing authentically who they are. And authenticity again coming back to survival is knowing that we can trust someone because they're reliable and they're true. 
And, and I think that's what we create with boys is we don't come in going, we're going to come talk about your mental health. I actually had a guy from an advertising agency go to me, mate, are you sure you should be calling your program the man cave? Like it just doesn't seem like it fits. And I was like, uh, well, yeah, mate, if I called it the feelings cave, I don't reckon <laughs> we'd have too many teenage boys rocking up. And and that's just the whole point, right? It's like, how do you, how do you just create an environment that boys actually want to be in? And then we can kind of just take them on that journey using language language that's accessible, relatable, and through people they want to be like. Hey, that's a great point. What, what are the most common themes? And I suppose we've touched on them all today, but like when you go to um, one of these presentations and you go to these schools, what's the most common um, opportunity you see in young men to get better? I should also say what we do is very much facilitation, which is really different to presenting. So we don't go in with like a 45 minute PowerPoint presentation yep. and try fix masculinity like that but we we walk in and it's really dealing with group cultures and it, it's like you know walking into a group of rowdy 50 like 50 rowdy teenage boys who can sniff fear a mile away have the best bullshit detectors in the world and so you have to be a certain person to be able to navigate and just kind of dance through the the group dynamics there but the the thing that is just without a doubt there is that they're boys feel there is an, uh, a silent but very consuming culture of judgment. So there's a real policing around their identity, around what they can and they can't do. And some real basic examples of that, like in one of our kind of very preliminary workshops, we get boys to write down on post-it notes, what does it mean to be a good man? You know, and they kind of go, oh, I know what this program's going to be. Like, it's going to be pretty shit. All right, I'll just write mm. this down. You know, to be kind, to be honest, to be respectful, to be, you know, to serve your family. And they kind of put it up on a wall. We then say to them, all right, what does it mean to be a real man? What are you seeing around you? What's really going on in your social media? What's society telling you what it means to be a real man? And like, you know, it's completely anonymous. Just write up whatever you want. And they just start giggling because they're like, have a big dick, you know, don't be a virgin, get heaps of chicks, like crack a cold one with the boys, don't be a pussy. And they are just losing their minds, putting that up on the wall. And then they're sitting down just cacking it. And we go, all right, what have we got here? And the boys like, well, we know that's who we're supposed to be, but like that's what we've kind of, we know is the reality. And we go, all right, this might take a little bit of honesty, but um, we want to see who's the bravest boy in the room. Who's ever felt pressure to be any of the things on the real man side? And without a doubt, you'll get 50 hands up in the air and we'll say, I'd love to hear from one of you. And again, boys step forward and go, man, I get called gay all the time. And, you know, the crazy thing is, it's not actually that crazy. I'm questioning my sexuality and it really impacts me when you guys pay me out like that. And suddenly with a moment, it's like a truth bomb like that. The room just stops still and this boy just becomes the bravest boy in the room. Mm. And we go to him, hey, mate, how does it feel to share that? And he'll go, well, I've always wanted to share that, but I just haven't known how. So I'm a bit nervous. And we go, what are you nervous about? And he goes, well, I just don't know how it's going to be received. And then we go, well, let's just ask the group, who's got enormous respect for this guy right now? 49 hands go up. And we go, well, what do you respect about it? And he goes, man, I just respect the bravery. I respect your courage, man. I don't care if you're gay or straight or whatever it is. And suddenly you look back at that boy who's opened up and talked about his, his sexual identity for the first time. Um, he suddenly looks like a human being again. He's not holding this like kind of weight on his shoulder and he finally gets accepted for who he is. And we just get to have magic moments like that on scale with thousands of boys. And, you know, that's the most common thing is boys just want to feel accepted, but they don't feel safe. So crazy, man. Like, uh, yeah, I, I, I was, felt like I was in the class then actually, like being a part of it. Cause I, I was just sort of reflecting on a few times but in my life where those conversations have had and it goes, it's the complete 180, right? Like this kid's copying shit yeah. for something his whole life. And then, he goes, you know what, I'm going to have an authentic, be honest and be brave and then turns into like the hero of the class. That's it. Yeah, and that's the thing. Boys just respect like heroicism. That's the yeah. summary. And whether that's on the field or, you know, moments of like radical courage um, in personal relationships. And, you know, th that's what we're just trying to create with boys is like let's not wait till it gets to crisis point for you to be incredibly honest and tell your best mate that you actually do love him. Um, and that not to be seen as like girly or gay as if there's anything wrong with that. And, and for me, that starts as young as possible, you know. And, and then the real art as well is how do you get the alpha on side in the, in the mm. group? 
because they can push and pull a group in many different directions and often they're just wanting the space to not be the alpha uh and once we can give them that opportunity where they can just share who they are or how hard it is being them it just completely dissolves any social status in the group and the boys just want to hang out as boys not like in this kind of social hierarchy yep I, i think there's two things there that really resonate with me and the fact that when you said about um someone coming forward and, and saying something brave it's it then gives the catalyst for like every other guy be like fuck oh, i want to be that guy now like yeah. i want to say what i'm proud about and what i'm vulnerable about and it creates that like ongoing effect so i think it's just like the first person that can do it even if someone's listening now in your friendship group and you don't you're not open or and and as honest as what you should be with your mates like it it might you might think that they will receive that badly but i can nearly guarantee it would be received the other way and if it isn't received well then they're obviously not your mates anyway in the first place and the second thing being that the the alpha male thing i really i agree with that completely i don't think that those boys or or men do want to actually be that they just think fuck i have to Mm. or you know it's challenging my ego if i'm not and they're probably not comfortable with themselves enough to to be who they really are yeah, that, that's it. And, and again, I, it comes back to me around guys feeling safe amongst other guys. And, and it's, it's so rare, you know, even come back to what you said around like, it's so risky to tell your mate how you're really feeling because we've got so much evidence as teenagers of doing that and being shut down, mm. you know? And so um, like I was, I was having a comment, I got a 17 year old younger brother and he was telling me that he, when he was 15, he opened up to his mates cause he was feeling a bit sad and his mate then started to use that as like banter. And I was mm. like, that's really interesting. Cause I reckon his mate didn't like he, it's almost unconsciously playing out. He's not, he's not wanting to insult my younger brother, but it's just happening. So yeah. I think the other side of it is like, if we're true mates, like what role do we play in knowing how to be with our mate when they do share something really honest? And, and you know, a really simple tool that I can just share that's made a massive difference for me and we, we use in the, the man cave is um, a very simple premise called permission versus trespass. So say, Dill, you share something with me and I'm like, oh, well, I don't really know how to be with that um one option to go explore in the moment is to say um hey dill do you mind if i ask you a couple more questions um that way i'm asking your permission in order to go further so you still have the power in the conversation versus trespass where it's like oh well tell me about that why is that so you see how i kind of jump in so it's very simple that permission versus trespass and often my experience you know the other side of that is and this is something that i think people just need to be discerning of in the moment is often people don't want to be fixed they don't want advice they just want the space to be heard and yeah. and i think that's probably one of the the most important things is how do we practice sitting in you know the messy awkward conversation that we kick you know we kicked off um this conversation with yeah. it's like i actually yeah. don't know the answer but i'm here for you mate yeah Oh, mate, I think that's what it is. It's honestly just two blokes bumbling alongside of each other. And you might not even get anything out, but I think just the subliminal messaging that you get to each other is that you actually are just just there for each other. And I just wanted to add as well with this because um, these authentic conversations, it's something for me now that they are a lot easier um, Mm. for me to have. And I love having them. Like I actually seek them out. Like I really enjoy it. And I think once you do get to that space it's actually hard to have a, a superficial conversation because you're just like, well, what do you mean by that? Like, actually, fucking, I, I want to know. But it was never, it wasn't that way. And the only way I, I would say I've got good at it, and when I say I've got, I've got good, you can still see today, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But the only way I've gotten better at it is by just putting myself and my friends in those situations of having those conversations. Um, and and the, the more you have, the better you get, the more you learn about certain people and that's just not male to male that's male to female to your family um to all these types of things and it's just yeah really putting yourself in that situation and taking the first step to having one that's it mate it's it's just similar to learning to ride a bike learning a new language going to the gym it's just it's it's getting the reps in uh, and that's just the most simple way to think about it. it you develop more capacity you develop more language um and and i think that's what it comes down to is just just time in the ring uh, one thing i'm really passionate about and i think that has had a big impact on me in this space is role models and um, I'm, I'm a really big believer in you are who you surround yourself with um you, you know like i look at my friendship group now and um if you look at them it's actually more a reflection of you than mm. than them i think I, I really do believe that um 
uh, and a lot of my mates um, as males, I think we are quite competitive and they push you in certain things. If, if you've got mates that are really driven in their career or sport or, or just to be a good person, you want to do that too. Um, and I think another one with role models is that, that we can often be mistaken by is everyone always looks at role models and they, they, they have someone to look up to. And, and for me, um, and I say this in the nicest way possible, but a lot of things that I've learned from role models haven't actually been positive role models. Like there've been people that I've seen and I've been like, all right, you're a role model in my life, um, but I'm going to learn from the things that you probably didn't learn from or the things that I didn't like as much as what you have. Um, so I think there's just two parts of that that I think are, are so um, beneficial for me personally, but I think can help a lot of young men. You know, we, we grow up with family and friends around us where we think we, we need to turn out like them, but there's actually things that you can take from them and go like, okay, I like this about this person. They're really, really good at this, but this sort of side of them, I don't, you know, I can actually learn from that too in another way. Yeah, I love that. And one of the... Um you know, my, my parents divorced when I was younger and it was just pretty confusing as a kid trying to navigate that. But I remember my mum just left me with this golden piece of advice, which has always stayed with me, which is, you know, look at the, the qualities in your parents that you really respect and admire and try to replicate them in your life. But then look at the qualities that you don't respect or you don't agree with and see how you can turn them into strength in your own role as a human being or as a, as a parent. And it was just such a different way to think about um, you know, whether it's parenting, caregivers, guardians, role models, that of course people are flawed. Like, of course people are flawed. But the, instead of us being the victim of, I didn't get that part of love from my, you know, my dad or I didn't get um, told, you know, he's proud of me or he loves me or, or whatever it is, it's going, well, maybe he showed me love and pride in a really different way. Maybe it was through acts of service. Maybe it was through him going to work and working his ass off so that I could live the life that I'm living now. And there was a real moment for me, probably when I was in my mid twenties, where I was just working through a bit of stuff. I was seeing a psychologist, and um, a bit of anger came up about my parents and and you know just how I was treated, it's, or how I thought I was treated. And I just had this moment where it all flipped for me, where I was like. I get to go on the path I'm on now because of what they've set me up for, the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. And how do I make those moments that I don't agree with that were really against my values as a human being, how do I make them teachable moments for me? As I become a father or you know, in a relationship with someone, how can they be my strengths opposed to just my traumas playing out? And that was just like a really interesting flip for me on the psychology of the whole thing. And, and I think, you know, role models don't have to be, you know, the, the, you know, the guy in the shining lights. It's like, who's the ordinary, extraordinary people in your community that just show up, you know, with kindness, with curiosity, who give you the time of day, who, you know, are just generous or who are incredibly disciplined and strong, like cherry pick what it means to you to be a good human being and just work out who those people are around you. I love it. I love it. Hey, can I ask you some questions? Yeah, please do. <laughs> What's it been like to transition out of professional sport? To be honest, the, the hardest part for me wasn't the transition. So like not when I finished, it was while I was still playing footy. Mm. And it was at towards the end of my career when I was like, all right, let's be really honest with myself here. I know that at best I've got, you know, five years left, but realistically I've probably got one or two and that was when I was like, oh, like, who am I like without footy? Like, are my friends still going to like me? Like, am I still that cool guy that, um, you know, has uh, followers on Instagram? Am I, am I still going to be looked at differently, you know, when I'm not playing footy anymore? And I think that was like a really hard part because I was like, who the fuck am I? Like, I really don't know without this, like, what, what am I? And I, what, mm. what's my purpose? What do I want to get out of life? And that was probably the pitiful moment for me to be like, you have to engage yourself in something else other than this. Um, and, and it did sort of to, uh, also the fact being like, I wasn't entirely um, happy when I was playing football, not, not because of the situations and being picked, but I, I just didn't actually feel like that was my purpose in yeah. life. Like I felt like I had something more to give than, running running around and, and playing footy and, and I'm not cutting short any AFL players at all I just thought like this wasn't something that was for me so I think the transition period actually took a lot earlier than that um, trying to start my next phase and what that was and, and having impact I think as all humans all we want to have is is have impact um, and I think that 
like yourself and like all the things we had today, really similarly, um, all those things that I'd learnt as a kid and all those things that I'd learnt to get to where I am now, I was like, I've got to be able to pass these messages on and I want to talk to people that have been in the same situation as me because, as you said before, having man cave, if I had man cave at, a, at school when I was a kid, I would have been five years, ten years ahead of where I am now. Mm. But imagine if I could share maybe some of my stories similar to man caves with other people, like hopefully that could help them and also better me in the process. So a long-winded short, the transition, um, it was really, really challenging, but I also think looking at what you said before about adversity, I now look at adversity as one of the best things ever in my life because whenever I have adversity, um, it doesn't get any easier. Like it's fucking sucks. Like I'll be honest, like no one likes going through it, but you always come out better from it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Dil, I just want to acknowledge you for just the transition, um, you know, because I got made to a professional athletes and, and, you know, one of the things which we talk about is like the identity and the purpose. And, and it's so hard because you can eat, have all the support structures around you, but you still have to go on the journey of rediscovering who you are outside of a system which you've become acclimatized to. And I think, yeah, what it's just amazing just to watch what you've done to make your journey so accessible to others. And I think people feel so connected to you because it's also what they're living through. So I just think it's like a massive show of leadership, man. And I just, I really respect you for doing it. And I think just like taking the seriousness out of it too, just making it so accessible to, to people. So I think that's really special, man. Um, and the, the next piece for me there is like, do you think there's enough support for players who are in that kind of, transition um or that kind of identity crux where they're like god i can kind of go two ways here is there enough support for for players a really good question again and i and when i when i answer this as well i i, I don't like to speak holistically of afl players but i even like to say it in if for males and females and anyone in general i think this is like an issue in society like we, we think we have to do a certain role and we can't change our path or our purpose at any stage in our life but there is so much time to, to change. And I think there's so much support around AFL players, especially to do everything. Like I'll say the, the AFLPA, um, we were, you know, I speak about a lot, but without them, I would have been absolutely nowhere because they're yeah. one of the biggest support networks I've ever had. Um, mentors outside of football were massive for me. Um, but I think the biggest thing in, in this is you can't, if, if something's going to happen, like, you have to be proactive with it yourself. Mm. Like no one, like no one went up to you and said, Hey Hunter, um, the man cave, this is a really good idea. I'll set it up for you. And then you go and present. Um, you have to be proactive and you have to out, you have to put yourself out there. You have to have those awkward conversations. You have to ask people how to, um, do something, you know, like there was so many times where like I, and, and to be honest, I say this because I was forced to do this because I had no other option. I knew that my career was ending. Mm. So I, I, I was forced to go and seek out people and go in awkward situations, put myself out there. But that's why we spoke about adversity before. I look at it as some of the biggest blessings for me in my life because if I was still in the AFL now and playing football, there's absolutely no way I would have asked myself these questions at 25, 26 um, you know, even 22 years of age, yeah. um, I'd probably be hitting him at 30 years of age and or 40 years of age or later in my life. So, yeah, I look at it um, really positively and I spoke to Andrew Gaze um, last week and he said something that really resonated with me in the, in this fact. And I, and I think everyone, look, I, I can't say everyone should look at it like this, but at some point in your life, I hope that people can look at their lives like this. I'm genuinely like the luckiest bloke in the world. Like, I feel like I've been just for a better, lack of a better word, I feel like I've been kissed on the dick. Everything in my life, is, I, just, I just feel like I'm blessed um, and I feel, I'm, I'm sure that you feel like you're the same. Yeah, oh, mate, I love that. And it's also like, I think just to make that accessible to people listening, it's not like you just went from, oh, here's who I am and now I'm the luckiest bloke in the world. It's like you took little steps then that allowed you to take that leap of faith to, ma to have that as an internal belief. And mm. so I think... Um, yeah, dude. And I think, I think it's just if, you know, 
whilst you didn't have much choice, you also did have a choice, you know, like you, you're, you could probably choose other things, but I think what you've done really well, and which is why I think people are so responsive to you, Dil, is that like, this feels like an extension of your personality. And it's like sitting down with a mate and just having a D&M, you know, as some guys might have it a couple beers in, others might not, but it just feels like it's an extension of you. So I think, you know, yes, you're lucky, but also sometimes you make your own luck. And, and I think you've done that really well, mate. Love that quote. I do. I do love the make your own luck quote. It's funny you say um, extension of having DNM and, and the conversations we probably both have. I can imagine we're quite similar. But my fiance, um, you know, she <laughs> we're we're very opposite people, but like just so, like you know, she's a, just the best person in the world, and she gives me very direct feedback. And <laughs> you're saying then about DNMs after a couple of beers. Well, you know what? I like, I am completely sober at the moment, and I'm bearing my heart and soul to you can you imagine what i'm like after a couple of beers like yeah. i meet people when i'm like tell me about yourself and I, I i just need to know everything and just like my partner tofu princess she's always like dylan you've got to know that like people don't want not everyone wants to talk to you about everything yeah. and i'm like okay i'll take that on board <laughs> thanks for the constructive feedback yeah. in our relationship <laughs> i will do my best and probably fail again yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. oh yeah I do it but yeah the, the big one is the one beer deep just going around the circle telling everyone what we love about them even if I've just met them in, <laughs> in the first five minutes is one of my favourites um, to get going so try that one out if, if you haven't already that is so hey, good hey um, back to your stuff mate because like today I think we've touched on some incredible issues but one thing that you do so well is the action items going forward like it's all well and good to have awareness about all this stuff um, it's all well and good to talk about it but what can we actually do going forward to help young men, men, boys, anyone else that you know, uh, women that have partners, everyone, we're helping every single person going forward. What are action items that you think we can get better at, or how can we help support everything to um, have a more prosperous future? Oh, I love that. Um, well, I think you know the reason I focus on boys with the man cave is not because it's solely about boys, but it's about the relationships those boys will have and the men they'll be in their communities. And so I think there's a, it's, you know, we're, we're, as we said at the beginning, we're such an inflection point for masculinity where it's, it's, you know, on some ways we're told to toughen up, don't cry, don't be a pussy, don't be like a girl. But on the other hand, now we're told be more vulnerable, cry more often, share your feelings more. And it, it's pretty confusing to know where to begin. And so what I think is the best way that we can support is actually by supporting the next generation of us coming through. I think there's a deep down desire in all of us to be the role model that we wish we had. And I think role modeling can take place in a variety of different ways. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, come to a program or, or, or anything like that. But I think it's finding the little moments with the young people in your life, irrespective of what gender they identify as, where you can be there just to actively listen to them. And I think just keeping in mind that it takes time to, to build trust. It takes time for them to feel safe with you. But I think um, just authentically sharing your story with them. You know, what was your life like when you were 14? What were the things that really sucked? What were the things you had to work through? What were the things that you learned? Um, and doing it in a way that's not like, yeah, it's not like this you're giving them advice but actually you're just connecting with them going yeah it's fucking full on and confusing as fuck being a teenager um so i think if you can find access to some of the young people in your life i really think you know there's an amazing quote that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others and and i think uh, if you're just at a bit of an end or you're looking for a change where is it that you can volunteer where is it you can help out what you know is there kids around in your local area that you can kick a footy with whatever it is just take that leap of faith i think will make a massive difference and then for me it just comes down to something really simple and that's doing our own personal development work and that again doesn't mean you have to go to tony robbins but i think it can start at home you know are you journaling are you meditating are you leaning into conversations that you wouldn't normally have with yourself and with others and i think then you know, trying to take that leap of faith with your friendship group in a way that, you know, you can bring all of you guys on the journey opposed to just, you know, going out being like, I just did this seminar. I'm super woke now. I'm now fixed masculinity. It's like, we don't need that. It's a bit gross, but actually how do we make it accessible for guys? So, you know, if, you know, you got a weekly, you know, sorry, a weekly, I was going to say a, a yearly boys trip. Um, you know, is there a way that you can before, you know, you 
hit the golf balls for the weekend or whatever it may be that you can have a night together where you sit a, you know a case of beer down in the middle and you go around and, and check in around how life really is and it might be clunky and awkward and weird um but you know as we said about before it, that's where you get the reps in and it, it will soon become part of your culture because i just really want us to get to a point where when we're proactive about our well-being opposed to reactive and you know putting a sport analogy on that it's like how do we play offense opposed to defense and i just think yeah it's got to start now because COVID's just bringing a lot of things to the forefront and, and i think you know, even if sending this podcast is a starting point to have a discussion about, I think yeah. that's a, a simple, simple place to start. Love that, and and not, I'm not saying this to to pump up the the show or this chat, but I think that is an actually incredible way to, to do this. Is, um, is sometimes is is going there and just having a chat with a mate straight away. Hey, how how are you feeling? It actually is really tough, and yeah. I don't. It's so hard to do that, and to be honest, I still struggle sometimes doing that myself, but. Um, you know, big ways that I do that is by sharing content. So when, say, for example, Hugh Van Kylenberg, Ben Crow do something, you send that with your mates and you go, oh, listen to this, this is cool. Yeah. And then they go, oh, you know, I really like this from that part. And then that's how it really grows. It's finding something, a common ground in the middle um, that, that grows. Because as we said earlier, um, when, I, when we both probably started having these first initial conversations about what is it to be a healthy, healthy man and a prospering man in society, I could probably put three words together. Now I can put four. Um, it's, it's still not much better, but it's, it's, getting, it's getting better. And I'd like to think that, um, that people are enjoying that along the way. And look, there, there probably is some, some, some males that have listened to the show today and, and they might have already tuned out that, that aren't on this journey yet. But I'll just say one thing, like, fuck, when you, when you do really just drop your shoulders and you just go like, fuck, just breathe, and you go... Am I actually like who I want to be or am I thinking I am someone else? It is just like a weight off your shoulders and it's just like you can just really just chill out and you just don't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> you work so out good. how much you've been carrying for fucking ages and you're like, yeah. oh, I can put that I down. I used to think I just had massive traps, but like realistically, they just, no. it was just a whole bunch of stress. I was just heaps anxious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, mate. Well, yeah, no, and I, I think it's like... My, my experience of this is that innately we want to connect and it's just about finding what's the most effective ways to connect given the culture of our mateship group. Uh, yeah. And, you know, that's different different for each of us and um, nothing's better or worse, but I just think, you know, just finding those little ways to, to kind of nudge closer to one another really helps. And I think that um, I do with a bunch of my mates and we do it every day at the Man Cave as well as with the boys in our programs is we do something called a check-in, which is basically you just get 60 to 90 seconds just to check in every day um, we do it around how life is really going for you and it doesn't have to be this kind of deep thing some days you can be like you know what actually I'm feeling pretty good today and there's not too much for me to check in about but other days you might be like listen I couldn't sleep last night my brain was going wild that went into a spiral I started to think about this thing I said and so I'm feeling a bit anxious today and you know uh, I'm conscious I got a big week coming up and a few deadlines and you know I'm not showing up with my relationships as well as I want to and and, um, you know, my, my, I got my, my winter rig on, so I'm not feeling too good about my, my bod at the moment, oh, yeah. you know, whatever it is. But you just have that space just to kind of check in. And it's just like once you develop, you know, talking to what you were saying before, like just get the rhythm of it. It just starts to become part of, of who you are. And so I think, you know, if there's one tangible thing, guys who want to do something as a mateship group just checking in with your mates um and yeah like i said it might be a bit weird and awkward at the beginning but you know it's it's about being better mates at the end of the day love it um mate, just a little bit about you here and i, I know you you're a you're a very humble man and and don't want your tires pumped up too much but you're the ceo and founder of about 45 different companies um one obviously being the man cave and, and another one being stuff which is an incredible um brand i'm a massive massive fan of this and and not just the product but just the reasoning behind it um helping fund young men's uh men's mental health and 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 everything that goes behind the man cave tell us a little bit about this and, and how it started and um and how we can support awesome mate uh so Man Cave's a, a charity. We charge schools based on their socioeconomic status and we rely on donations. And so about four years ago, I just started to think, I'm like, how do we create a new income stream for Man Cave? But also, you know, 
I just started to think with with my mate um, Jamin, who we who kind of the idea kicked off with, was what would it look like to create a brand or a product that aligned to the man cave that could use the power of brand and consumerism to create a positive social change movement for young men, but also create a new funding stream for the man cave. And I just started to think, I was like, we're at a really interesting time where there's, you know, really cool social impact businesses. Like in Melbourne, we've got Thank You, we've got Who Gives a Crap, we've got Tom Organic. And I just started to think there was nothing for blokes. And yeah, and I just started to think when I was a teenage boy, what was central to my identity? You know, I was getting hairier, I was getting smellier, Lynx <laughs> deodorant, you know, Lynx yeah, Africa, yeah. right? Yeah. The double can, spray yourself, gorgeous women come chasing, you know. Oh, I think that young men didn't realise as well, you still had to actually like have showers. You couldn't just, just <laughs> no. use Lynx. Like that, that wasn't, that message wasn't spread I think uh, well enough. The shower in the can was the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you could go under, <laughs> underarms, overarms and, you know, a little bit down, down there too. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah and you know for that point exactly i was like surely it's time to create something new and so yeah we, we launched this business after about four years at the start of this year and we wanted to call it something that was just simple and uncomplicated uh and so we called it stuff so it's like stuff for your face stuff for your pits stuff for your body and um basically it's personal care for guys at an affordable price point that's like you know vegan cruelty free recyclable products um and we've built it with some of people who've worked in the biggest brands in australia working across esop mecca afterpay country road thank you so people have worked in big brands before but really believe in the purpose that we're working on and um, so the, the model is that, you know, staff obviously will run as a business separate to Man Cave, but also fund Man Cave programs. So really giving guys that point of purchase decision where you can go, you know, I can go Old Spice, I can go Brute, I can go Lynx, or I can choose stuff, which I know will help a boy become a better man. So yeah, mate, we've, we're about four and a half months in. It's been a hell of a journey, um, but it's been amazing how well people have received it and including you, dude. Like, it's just been awesome, you know, being a part of the show with you and uh, having you give it away. It's like, you know, people listening to this are kind of bang on who we want on this journey with us. Yeah, no, you've been dominating, mate. And, and the reason I love working with with stuff is exactly that and everything we spoke about today. And it's been, it's been really um, fortuitous, I suppose, to have you on um, to tell a story about it as, as a brand, but also the man cave and, and what it all is. Cause I think, um, not, I know you already had a lot of fans, but I think sharing the messages and why it's so important is already going to bring a lot more there. And also, can I just say the new, I don't know if it's just in front of my mind. It's like that thing when you look at a red car and you see a red car, but I've seen so many of the uh, posters, the stuff posters getting around in Melbourne at the moment. They uh, Whoever designed them is doing a great job and uh, they're hitting, I don't know if it's just tracking like my space. Well, I'm only yeah, around, but it's... Uh, they're, they're looking good. Is there such thing as positive stalking? Uh, let's make yeah. it. I think that's what's going on. But yeah, you know, the cool thing of all the, the guys in the stuff photo shoots are all man cave facilitators. So they're all the guys who go out and deliver programs. So yeah, it's really cool infusing both businesses. And um, yeah, the, the posters are a cool way to kind of get the awareness around. I think particularly the, uh, the inner north, which is uh, hipster territory, which we love. Yes, yes, we do. Hey, and uh, if anyone does want to use some stuff, I know this is uh, wasn't planned, but we do have a code stuff deal for for twenty percent off, and that is stuff as in the good way, not stuff deal the bad way. It's stuff deal uh, at uh, there, and all the links will be in the show notes. So definitely, definitely applaud you to, to check that out and help fund young men's mental health because that's what we are all about. Hey, Hunter, what's next for you, my friend? I feel like you've look, you're thirty years of age. You've created a charity. You've created a business. You've had some incredible social change. You've already done so much. Where's the ceiling for you? Like, what, what's next? What do you want to achieve? Mate, we just really want to grow what we've got going on at the moment. So from a man cave point of view, I mentioned there's like 300 schools on the waiting list, um, inc- including international demand. So it's just working out how do we scale across Australia and then um, replicate what we're doing overseas. Uh, and the whole model, again, is just using relatable role models in high schools that normalize guys talking about what's going on. So growing man cave, uh, but then also stuff. You know, we, we really want stuff to be a global brand and to really kind of take the you know the the mantle that has been held by by links for so long um and really just provide an access for guys to to 
to you know choose with their wallets something that aligns to their values and um you know that's just been an incredible learning journey for me i often joke i'm like i swear in when i'm in meetings i'm just silent and i'm like i swear i'm not that dumb i'm just just so new and it's just coming on real quick um but i'm just loving the journey of, of working out how to sell a product like this in a way that you know for some people who don't really give a shit that it's got a social purpose but they just want it as a quality product so yeah really want to grow that business um so that we can keep the good work of the man cave going fantastic mate um i think we've nailed it today um yeah i think we've nailed it in the most unnailing way if that makes <laughs> yeah. sense like i don't know if we actually made sense with anything i was saying but i really enjoyed the conversations yeah mate and again <laughs> i'm i'm just grateful for just how you do this dude and it's just so nice to talk to you so thank you yeah um i've got a I, I, by the way i get um uh, authenticity here but i i over say the word transpire which i haven't said in like three episodes because i've like literally tried to black it out because for one it, i don't even use it in the right context <laughs> and two i just don't even know what it means but the the one word now i'm really starting to use i picked up fortuitous off an episode oh. with, with nick stone and i just love that word that so is a i just wanted to, to let you know also lucrative is another word that i'm using at the moment a lot <laughs> I, I mean, don't even you know why I told you that. You just know it was good. I think it honestly did. has nothing to do with anything we were talking well, about. So I'd let you know it's that. It's been a lucrative conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I think it has. I think we've had some lucrative <laughs> lessons for the fortuitous future, my friend. And it's a, it's a pleasure to, to talk to you. Can't wait to catch up hopefully soon when all this nonsense is, is finished for a few beers. And um, yeah, be good, man. Awesome, mate. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here, Dale. I appreciate it. This week's episode is brought to you by Stuff. So with Father's Day right around the corner, what am I getting Big Jim this year other than a kiss on the lips? Some Stuff. Stuff is a personal care brand that helps fund young men's mental health through their charity partner, The Man Cave. For every $1,000 in sales, Stuff will sponsor one boy to experience The Man Cave's life-changing programs. It's genuinely a win-win. When you buy your dad's stuff, you're doing good and helping him smell even better. Thank them later. They've got stuff for your body, your head, your face, your pits, and all the important bits. It's Australian-made, cruelty-free, planet-friendly, and also contains no bad stuff like parabens and aluminium. So shop Father's Day gifts at websiteofstuff.com and get your order in by the 31st to make sure Dad gets his gift in time. So use the code STUFFTILL for 20% off at the website of stuff.com. The link will also be in the show notes. Let's go.